All right, well, welcome everybody to the Upstate Professional Planners meeting. Uh, today is what, October 28th, 2020. Um, I want to thank 10 of the top for, for putting this meeting on as always. Um, and quickly pre thank our presenting sponsor, uh, Milliken, for, for assisting with this, um, for assisting with Upstate Professional Planners and 10 at the top, as well as our supporting sponsor, Rewa. My name is Mike Foreman. I'm the co-chair of the, the Upstate Professional Planners uh, for 10 at the top. Um, my partner in crime, uh, Phil Lindler, um, is running a little bit late. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. We're going to uh, hear from uh, Darren Meyer with MKSK and Joel Tichy of Trees Upstate. Uh, I've got uh, obviously got this uh, exciting project they're working on, the Unity Park plan. Um, so they're going to give us a little update on that. Um, and we're really, really excited to, to hear from them. So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Darren. He's got a presentation and then Joel will follow. Uh, and then we'll open it up to about 15, 20 minutes of Q&A. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, the project that the upstate planners have been working on, uh, that the group has been working on, uh, give you an update on the, the comprehensive plan update uh, that we have been, uh, been, been following here for, for a little bit. So um, with that, Darren, I'm going to open it up to you. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Michael. Okay, Justine, do I have my screen up here? Great. All right, well, it's great to, to see everyone virtually uh, today. My name is Darren Meyer. I'm a principal with MKSK. We're a uh, city planning and landscape architecture firm based out of Greenville, South Carolina. Um, MKSK is a, a firm that's about 30 years old, um, but fairly recently moved to the upstate. Um, I opened the office in 2017, actually on the day of the eclipse was our first day, which was, was pretty interesting. I didn't plan that, um, sort of caught me by surprise. Um, but um, we have spent the past three years uh, enjoying getting to know uh, the communities in the upstate, um, doing some work here locally, uh, as well as throughout uh, the southeast. Um, our projects really range quite a bit in scale. Um, we've done work for rural communities in, in South Carolina and Georgia as well as current work in some larger communities. We're doing a master plan for the Civil Rights District in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, master plan for the Riverfront District in Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, and a master plan for the Upper West Side uh, in Atlanta, one of the fastest growing uh, areas of the city there. So quite a range of work uh, which we've enjoyed. And um, one of the, the projects that's been uh, really rewarding to work on uh, is Unity Park, uh, which we wanted to share a little bit about today. Um, one of the things that we have um, really been careful to highlight as we talk about the park is even though the park itself and some of the renderings um, make its way uh, occasionally into um, some media, really the work that has been done um, on the west side of Greenville um, in, in the past years has been significant and, and we have tried to build on that. So really for the past decade, uh, largely, there's been some really great community-based planning um, that the city has led on the west side of Greenville, um, starting with some federal funding and some comprehensive planning that was done um, earlier in this decade, um, up through 2014. And then we sort of picked up um, several years ago to advance not just the park, but some of the planning on the west side as well that had been done. So you can see a number of the different pieces um, that have taken place over the years. And really our goal was to build as seamlessly as we could um, on all of that good planning work that had been done previously. Uh, one of the things that drove um, our involvement and drove the planning around Unity Park um, was development pressure that was being felt on the west side of Greenville. Part of that is you look at downtown Greenville in blue here, this view, our, our study area is outlined um, in the dashed black. Um, you can see that it's just adjacent to downtown Greenville, which is one of the most vibrant downtowns, uh, not just in the upstate, but really in the country. Uh, it's an amazing place. And so naturally um, you have a market um, for those that want to be both in that downtown and near downtown, which is, is part of our study area. So tremendous amount of development pressure just due to uh, the vibrancy of downtown Greenville. 
You also have the Swamp Rabbit Trail, which has a tremendous number of trail users per year. The more discussions that we had um, with some of the, the local businesses and retailers, it's, it's really remarkable how um, a lot of those sort of defy retail logic wanting to locate places that aren't really highly visible from roads but are attached to the trail. Um, and so there's, there's just very significant benefit that that trail offers um, both for uh, residents uh, and for businesses as well, which was driving some of that development interest. And then lastly, um, and partly due to um, the success of Falls Park um, and other examples, the prospect of a well-designed and well-maintained signature park um, has a positive impact on adjacent real estate and the development community is aware of that. And so those three things combined among others, uh, the strength of Greenville's downtown, the Swamp Rabbit Trail and, and the prospect of Unity Park had created some development interest and development pressure on the west side of Greenville. And one of the things that the city of Greenville did, which was really thoughtful and I think forward looking and, and even today, not, not very many communities approach it this way is um, they worked across the professional internal silos um, to have uh, sort of multiple prongs to this effort. So uh, in addition to looking at the park itself, part of our work, which we, we kicked off um, in early 2016 involved um, some community planning, a community character plan an affordable housing strategy and a form-based code to help um, align development with communities expectations from a regulatory standpoint. Um, and it was about a 350 acre study area that you see here on the west side of downtown. And even from the city standpoint, even the project management was divided um, across departments within the city, which was nice working with both community development and parks. Um, and now as we're getting into the development of the park itself engineering as well. Um, just a few notes um, of all those aspects that I mentioned that were part of this, um, the park design, the affordable housing strategy, uh, the form-based code. I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to say that, that since 2016, all of those have advanced. Um, the, uh, the code was adopted this summer, uh, the affordable housing strategy, which I have a few slides here to share, um, is advancing as well. Um, one of the things that's unique about this approach is that um, again, the city was looking proactively at the desire for affordable housing around the park. And one of the really great moves that they made um, was dedicating a significant amount of, of city owned property, dedicating that to affordable housing. And they have recently been working in partnership with the Greenville Housing Fund um, and other partners to help bring those, um, those parcels and the potential developments on those parcels to fruition to the market as quickly as possible. So you had the city dedicating, you know, just under 10 acres um, and probably roughly eight to 10 million based on some, you know, comparable real estate exchanges in the area, which, which is very, very significant in addition to the trust fund and, and other support that the city has made. Um, so we have the opportunity for um, between three and 400 affordable housing units, which are really actively moving forward at this point um, in partnership with the Greenville Housing Fund. The other thing that we did to help um, stimulate um, some additional affordable housing throughout the area is as part of the form-based code, which we developed, and you can see uh, just a snapshot of the regulating plan here. Um, one of the things that we developed was um, what we called uh, development flexibility incentives. And I'm just sort of toggling through a little bit of the um, imagery that was associated with the affordable housing study. Um, but we put some development flexibility incentives in the code to help encourage development of affordable housing. So we looked at everything from heightened density um, to lot coverage, setbacks, parking, et cetera, um, to be able to provide an incentive for either market rate or nonprofit affordable housing developers to come into the area and, and be able to either um, ease some of the cost burden of developing housing or having some incentive for additional units, additional density or height that could be incorporated um, with the provision of affordable housing. And one of the ways that we did this is, is we looked very carefully at what we call the market limit. Um, you know, so in Greenville's case, their, their downtown zoning, their C4 zoning um, essentially has no height or density limits. Um, and so we look to see sort of at the edge of that C4 near our, our property, um, what the market would build 
in the absence of height restrictions or density restrictions. So that in other words, if we're creating a development incentive, we're not kicking into a height or density or construction type that really isn't feasible in the market um, if it's unrestrained. So we wanted to make sure we had that perspective as we we're sort of developing these pieces. And I don't believe there's there's probably a couple of folks from the city on the call today. I don't know that anything has has really applied or been built against this yet, but we're really excited to see this as a template and hopefully it'll be successful um, and applied more broadly. Um, if so, so that's a little snapshot of what's happening around the park and how integral the planning for the community and the neighborhood around the park was. But I wanted to move quickly into the park design itself. One of the things, if you're familiar with this area um, along the Reedy River is it does flood. Um, and these are a few images of how significant that flooding can be. Uh, there's one in here, this one, you can see the, um, uh, the Liberty Bridge across Falls Park and it's really sort of terrifying to see uh, that amount of water moving through there. Um, and of course, uh, formerly the city's public works facilities uh, were located um, on this site in this floodplain. So the relocation of those is really critical um, as part of this effort, um, particularly because of those flooding issues. But the bottom line is um, when you look at this park area is if you take the, the 60 acres that we're looking at just adjacent to downtown, 97% of which is in the floodplain, you know, the question is, what do you do with that? Um, it's, it's really not eligible for development for a number, number of reasons, you know, environmental and water quality reasons, uh, you know, health and human safety reasons. There is some development in the park, which, which um, has pre-existed um, and a little bit of renovation of those uh, along Wellborn Street. Um, but for the most part, um, having 90%, 97% of this park in the floodplain really means that this approach to creating passive, largely passive urban park space, I think is a great solution to urban floodplains. Um, you don't wanna leave that 60 acres just completely vacant and unused during the, the large portion of the year when it's not flooding, but you certainly have to be sensitive during those flood conditions. So that was sort of one of the top drivers of how we approached the design. The other was building on, and I have to give tremendous credit to the city of Greenville and the community development department for the relationships that they had built in the community around the park. Um, we certainly benefited in terms of having conversations with the community from that trust and those relationships that had been built over years. But in addition to sort of the natural restraints, the flood, et cetera, of the park, working with the community, understanding um, what their preferences and desires for the park and how they would use it was really a key component. And you can see a summary here. I'm, I'm not gonna read off the slide, but these are some of the major themes that, that we pulled from both our engagement and the engagement that had been done previously, um, including some really great sort of anecdotes and quotes um, from the communities we worked through this process. So these were all sort of the, the key pieces that we wanted to make sure that we achieved um, as part of the, the park development. Uh, this shows um, the park in the context of downtown Greenville, which is on the right hand side uh, of the slide here. Um, we have uh, a significant increase. It's really a natural resource based park in the floodplain. Uh, we have an increase, a uh, large increase in restoration of the, the river itself and the, and the wetlands. We have a significant reduction in impervious area with the removal of public works, a lot of the parking. Um, and almost 90% of the park is landscape, um, and it, so it's unpaved. And one of the things that, you know, if you know Greenville well, um, the Reedy River is such a tremendous part um, of the identity, the fabric, the economy um, of the community. But this is a snapshot of what the Reedy River looks like in the Unity Park area, and it's, it's different than Falls Park. It's a lot different. Um, it's not the original Reedy River course. Um, it was straightened and channelized around the turn of the century, um, both somewhat related to industry and also sort of misguided attempts at, at, at flood management, which we do a little bit differently today. We did look early on at, at realigning the river to its original course, but among other constraints, there are some significant utilities that we couldn't get under or over and still make water run downhill. So uh, we had to look at a restoration approach um, with the river in place. Um, the other is that it's very flat. Hydraulically, the gradient is very low, particularly compared to the falls and the drama of Falls Park there. Um, so we had to consider that as well. So the way that we approach a river restoration, you can see this, um, 
diagram of the channels that exist today. It's pretty narrow, it's pretty straight, and it's fairly deep. It's been incised and disconnected from the floodplain. And you, you largely have turf grass running fairly close up to it and a, a thin band of, of narrow trees, a lot of which are invasive. So our first goal is what we're calling benching um, that floodplain. So we're really excavating out um, the active floodplain area to better connect uh, the river to its floodplain. And what I mean by that is um, because the river has been incised and channelized, you, you sort of lose that great interface between the aquatic habitat and the terrestrial habitat, which is so important during flood events. We're actually designing the park to flood more um, on smaller events. And that's part of uh, what this benching and excavating does. And then once we do that earthwork, we want to come back in um, with some native plant material um, that has some deep root architecture to help stabilize those banks, um, bring back the tree canopy um, to help create a uh, great habitat along the riparian corridor there, and then some sensitive access to the river um, for educational and recreational purposes. And you can see a view here um, of what that might potentially look like in this rendering. We also have some wetlands on site, which today uh, don't look really glamorous, um, but um, with a little bit of invasive removal and again, some, uh, you know, the addition of some boardwalks you can see in this rendering have some great opportunities to really capture um, those uh, great uh, natural environments that are largely in the northern end of the park uh, with the existing wetlands. And there's actually a lot of wildlife out there today. If you, it's, it's fairly surprising if you go out there, even in an urban area. And in terms of uh, crossing the river, um, you have about five city blocks. You've got a little over 2,000 feet between Hudson and Willard Street, which is pretty long ways to, to do a river crossing. So we looked at um, two crossings, uh, two pedestrian bridges, which you can see in this view here, um, to help facilitate um, movement between the two sides of the park. We have uh, sort of your classic quintessential park space, um, uh, what was originally called the Great Lawn. There's been some great private sponsorships, uh, Michelin in this case, um, of these pieces. But you can see here, this is the area for you know coming out, um, flopping around on the blanket with a lunch, throwing the Frisbee, football, et cetera. So this is sort of the front door to the park off of Hudson Street um, with the river in the background to the left. Um, Hudson Street itself, because of the rail, that runs around the south and west sides of the park and the river itself, um, there's not a lot of great connectivity. And Hudson Street, which is on the right-hand side of this view, is really the only street that connects north to the southern side neighborhood and south to West Greenville. Um, and so that's a really critical piece. Um, and if you look at it today, you can see the condition that it's in um, in terms of walking. The right-hand uh, picture is of Hudson Street there with some dirt paths. And one of the other sort of key notes that I wanted to make is that um, when we looked at the county of Greenville, you have about 7% of households without a vehicle. Um, when you sort of drill down into the neighborhoods immediately adjacent to Unity Park, that percentage of households without a vehicle jumps up to um, about 26%. So from a transportation equity, a social justice standpoint, having um, accessible sidewalks, comfortable, shady ways to get to the park, um, to the Swamp Rabbit Trail is really critically important. And so you can see again the existing conditions on Hudson today. There's a couple of folks on the left hand side of the view that are walking along that dirt path. This is um, the next slide shows a little bit of a diagram of those existing conditions. Uh, one of the things that we've been able to do is look at undergrounding some of the overhead power that you see and also taking that dirt path that's on the left and converting that into a, a wider multi-use trail. Again, so it's not just accessible, but it's really beautiful and comfortable and a great way to get from the adjacent neighborhoods um, to Unity Park and the river um, and the Swamp Rabbit Trail and all the amenities um, that are part of the development there. So sort of at the heart of the park, um, we have uh, a really great, what we've called a destination play uh, area, which is something unique um, in the region. And we worked very carefully to um, make sure that we, we sort of indexed our design around the developmental needs of children. You know, my impression when I was growing up, and, and I could be wrong, this, this maybe uh, predated me, but you know, the idea of having play areas is just a place to go sort of spin your wheels and take your kids I think short changes um, really what you can accomplish um, with particularly outdoor play areas. Um, so looking at some of these key components of, of childhood development that, that can be accomplished through play is, is important. 
And, and this is um, sort of an observation that I love of the difference between the ways adults sort of perceive their environment and the way kids do. And I have firsthand knowledge of this. I've got four boys that are under the age of 13. They range from three to 13. So I know they're definitely into climbable and splashable and squishable. Um, so we looked at the different um, sort of characteristics, uh, developmental characteristics of, of age cohorts that would potentially be using this play areas and making sure that, that we created the types of um, experiences that, you know, whether it's from a um, developmental standpoint, physically or socially, that we did our best to, to sort of address and incorporate those. So you can see a different kind of kit of parts here that we've broken out um, that looks at those different sort of physical developmental aspects um, and how those are combined then into certain features. And then you can see in this rendering um, how those come together in the finished product. So we're really excited to see uh, this take shape um, as a, a really unique um, kind of play environment uh, as part of the park. And associated with that, just adjacent to it is a water feature area, which in the summers when it gets hot, um, it's just magical to see how kids are drawn to water. And so um, this, I think is gonna be a great compliment um, being adjacent to that play area. We also have a tremendous amount of, of rich cultural history um, in the neighborhood, which um, honestly, you know, we have just scratched the surface of and are working hard to understand and how we incorporate those stories into the park. Um, one of these um, is uh, to honor the memory of Lila Mae Brock, um, which was um, uh, counselor William Fleming Brock's uh, mother and one of the, the really great leaders in the neighborhood of Southern Side. You can see a, a sculpture on the left-hand side, which, which has uh, been developed um, and is gonna be part of um, an area that we create uh, to honor her memory and her contributions to the neighborhood uh, that you can see in these plans and renderings. And this will sort of be at a gateway um, into the park area at Hudson and Washington. We also have uh, Mayberry Field, which was uh, a ball field. There were two ball fields in the area, one um, that hosted the uh, white baseball team, the other African-American baseball team played here um, back when um, the park use was segregated. And um, the, uh, the ball field that the African-American players use still exists. It's called Mayberry Field. And as we've learned, this is one of the most significant aspects of this park that we want to not just preserve, um, but how we can sort of capture some of the great stories um, and great memories uh, of this and looking into the future, how we not just create a ball field, but spaces around it um, for, for picnics, grill outs, lunches, events, those kinds of things that um, help build community. Um, so this is the ball field as it exists today. Uh, it floods and gets pretty wet um, these days. So we're looking at a lot um, to try and improve those conditions as well as creating some opportunities around it, as I mentioned, um, for storytelling. You can see here uh, some of the early models for what that would look like, a little bit of a, a night view. Um, but this is gonna be a great opportunity um, to sort of bring some of that forward um, and, and bring that history uh, into the design of the park. And then the last piece that I'll share sort of um, from these cultural elements um, is a connection from Southern side into the park that you can see up on the Northern end here You've got about 200 feet along former Nassau Street. That, um, that Google Maps note is wrong there. That's actually Nassau looking towards the river into the park. And the idea was that we wanted to create um, this sort of uh, you know, all encompassing experience. Visually, you've got the overhead plane, um, but this idea of, of wind chimes capturing the voices um, of, of, of some of the youth in the area. So, you can see our goal of, of working some um, custom wind catchers uh, that you can kind of see at the bottom of these chimes um, into this design. And, and you can see what that experience would be like um, having um, you know, the, the youth in the area create uh, their own. And each of the chimes is a different length by a very small fraction of an inch. So each chime has a, a unique voice, um, which we're excited um, to see how that pans out. We spent a lot of time looking at how to make sure these chimes aren't grating and, and too loud and sort of uh, annoying. Um, and so that, that's that been a lot of our mock-ups and testing uh, to make sure that we can do that sensitively. And then the last piece um, of the park is something that's sort of in the works for a future phase. Um, there's desire for an observation tower, which is sort of in the Southern end of the park here. Um, and this would be adjacent to Mayberry Field. Uh, this is an element that both would be iconic in terms of what you would see um, from the park and from the areas around the park, 
but also when you're up in the tower, you can get some really tremendous views of the park itself, of downtown Greenville, um, of the mountains in the distance. So this has the opportunity to, to be a really iconic element um, as part of the development of the park. So that is a, a sort of whirlwind snapshot of where we are in, in terms of park design and some of the park features. Um, so I wanna uh, kick it here over to Joelle um, to, to talk about uh, one key aspect of park design in, in terms of our trees and landscape. But let me check Joelle just before we do that. Justine, did we want to um, sort of combine these and then open up for questions or did we wanna pause for a moment here? So pause and do some questions now. We can put them in the chat or unmute either way. Great, yeah, I'd love to hear any thoughts or comments or, or questions about the park, if anyone has any. This is Lisa Halo from Upstate Forever. I, I don't think my video's on and I'm not gonna take the time to try to figure that out. But um, I wanted to, I was curious about the Unity Park Code and I joined this late, so you may have mentioned this. Um, but my understanding is that the, the code has been adopted by the city, but it sounded like no project has been yet developed under it. Is that right? Yes, it was adopted this summer. Okay, got it. And um, we had worked with, um, one of the things we're trying to um, encourage in the city in all areas is missing middle housing, the sort of, and I know that the code allows for that, which is awesome. Um, we had worked with Opticos Design on a review of Unity Park Code, and they had just had some questions for the city about the intention of the code and what it was going to deliver or in, to make sure that those two things matched. Um, and I was just curious if anything has gone forward with that. You know, I've um, had a couple of conversations with Brian Brown, who's the executive director of the Greenville Housing Fund. That's, yeah. you know, part of your effort um, with Opticos to look at that. And um, his sense was that everyone's intent is similar um, in terms of, of what ultimately our aims are uh, for the district here. So I think... Um, between the work that you've done as part of that review um, and, and coordinating with the city, my understanding is that is, is ongoing right now. Okay. So I, I think that's great to get that perspective brought into it. And, and I'm sure that's, that's gonna make it stronger. Do you have, I know with Jenny leaving, who is the head of the, or not the head, but sort of the lead focus from the city of Greenville on the Unity Park Code at this point? Would that be Jay Graham? It's, it, it may be, um, there, as you know, there's been a lot of turnover with staff yeah. there. And so, I mean, that, that's really a question that, that's probably better suited for um, someone that's, city. that's in yeah. the city at this point. Okay, got it. Well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Well, everyone can think about their questions too. Put them in the chat and we'll, we'll answer those after Joelle also. Thanks. All right, let me, uh, Joelle, give me just a moment here and I will pull up uh, Perfect. your well, I'll jump in while you pull that up. So I, I flipped through the participants. I see some familiar names there. So uh, just to give you a lead into Trees Upstate. Uh, Trees Upstate is a nonprofit. We were founded in 2005. We were formerly known as Trees Greenville. We rebranded re ourselves last year. Uh, to Trees Upstate for two reasons. One, to avoid confusion that we were not the city of Greenville. And then also this speaks to 10 at the top who now oversees the Upstate Air Quality Committee. Um, you know, ultimately the five counties, Oconee, Anderson, Pickens, Greenville, Spartanburg, air quality doesn't recognize the county board borders and, and boundaries. So we thought that it would be in our best interest to at least be able to do a little bit of work outside Greenville County lines, whereas we still remain focused and committed to our home base here in Greenville County. It is our priority area. We also now do a lot of work in, in Spartanburg County as far as tree plantings, and we also do a lot of tree giveaways and programming in Oconee, Anderson, and Pickens as well. So we're a nonprofit. Yeah. Sorry, to Sorry to interrupt. I think maybe your microphone is kind of moving around a little bit. A little oh, because I'm fidgety. Yeah, I'll try <laughs> to stay still. <laughs> well, what if I do this? I'm not going to. Look, how does that sound? Better? That's great. 
Thanks. Okay, perfect. So our mission is plant, promote, and protect. And uh, so we plant trees in park schools and neighborhoods throughout uh, the upstate. We promote the benefits of trees and tree planting. And uh, the protect piece is what people typically have the most questions on, especially with trees being in the news so much the last year or so, whether it's the tree that needs to be saved in the Alta Vista neighborhood or, you know, the Deodor Cedars down on Mills Ave. People are always really wondering what trees upstate does to protect trees. And this is a lot of our behind the scenes work. Um, so what we do to protect trees is ultimately provide education and technical support to help inform policy and systems change. And I know that that's a lot, but ultimately the protect piece is, you know, really getting the word out that we have uh, examples of large scale plantings and projects that have been done over the last 10, 15, 20 years even in the upstate that are examples of what not to do. And so we've got gr a great example with the shops at Green Ridge. We have large canopy trees that could and should be living, you know, 60, 80 plus years based on the soil volume, um, but they're not going to because they were planted improperly. Um, we've got Tiger River Park in Duncan, South Carolina, great example. I mean, close to it, let's round up, close to a thousand trees that were planted at Tiger River Park. And uh, it was really bad nursery stock and they were planted improperly. And so now the county is having to replace those trees. Uh, so bringing us here to Unity Park, Trees Upstate is super excited to be a project partner on this. And ultimately how we ended up being involved in this is that Doug Harper with Harper General Contractors approached us and said, hey, you know, we've got the opportunity here. We're doing a huge project and we wanna make sure that it's done right, that the trees, that everything regarding the trees is just as good as possible. And, you know, ultimately a model. So back to our protect piece, you know, I wanna go ahead and throw out a disclaimer. You know, these are MKS gate slides. Uh, they've done all the work here. Trees Upstate was part of the review process. Uh, and as such, our projects committee consists of two landscape architects, five certified arborists. Uh, so as a group, we've spent over 30 hours uh, reviewing the Unity Park tree plans. We've been on site, we've been on the ground, we've walked, we've looked at trees, we've um, looked at species. And we've spent a lot of time discussing it, making recommendations, asking a lot of questions. And I will say that, you know, uh, Harper and the city of Greenville really brought us in as authentic partners. Um, nothing about this did we rubber stamp with a Betty Crocker seal of approval. We were definitely engaged in the review process and we will continue to be engaged as um, landscape is installed. We'll be providing technical support as the installation goes in and we will be providing um, technical support along with long-term maintenance of the trees in the park. So with that said, there's sort of the overview of Trees Upstate. And as I talk about some of the key elements of this plan, I wanna throw out there, because again, I've seen the list of who's on this call. You know, keep in your mind that this is a great example of a uh, best practice, and this truly is a model when it comes to trees. And so if you can think of something similar that's either in the works or completed, um, I strongly encourage you to go to our website because last year we launched something called the Emerald Award. And with the Emerald Award, what we are looking for is we're really targeting developers, builders, big projects like this, where there are arborists engaged in the very beginning and throughout the whole entire piece until the end, and then also engaged in the aftercare of the trees. Um, so again, there are industry standards, uh, there's true tree care protection that can happen. And I will say that last year, when we were giving the Emerald Award for the first time, we really struggled finding a project uh, that truly had tree protection uh, and that really engaged arborists along the way. So with that said, uh, Darren is my slide mover because these are his slides. So let's see the first one. <laughs> uh, as it comes up here. Yeah, have, 
There we go. Um, so I'm going to start with the upper right hand corner and I want to draw your attention to essentially two trees are going to be planted for every one tree removed. Um, this is a really big piece of why Trees Upstate was engaged um, because we're looking at ultimately a reforestation plan. Um, you know, the important piece here is that Trees Upstate approves of the reforestation plan and truly believes that when all is said and done and the, and the park is completed and we grow these trees out, uh, we're going to end up with a better result than what we have now. So about two trees are going to be planted for every one removed. And now in the upper left, you'll see the breakdown of what's going back in. So the trees going back in, this is a big part of our review process of what the species are. Um, so mostly native species and cultivars of course, a few ornamentals. And some of the ornamentals ultimately are going in because they have to, it takes trees a long time to grow. So when we talk about just the riparian zone and that buffer, if all we're doing is relying on trees to you know, hold the soil in place, uh, we're not gonna get there. We're, we're gonna lose all of the work done. And currently bottom left-hand corner in the infographic, you'll see that now there are 12, about 12 trees per acre. And when the project is complete and everything is replanted, we're looking at 20 trees per acre. And then there is gonna be some reuse of the trees that are removed on site. So we can go to the next slide. Of the tree removals, uh, this was the very first thing that we did. Uh, there was some concern that when trees started being cut down, that there was gonna be a kerfuffle, if you will, <laughs> because sometimes people don't like to see trees come down. Um, so of the trees surveyed, uh, you know, ultimately I went out there with another one of our, with a master arborist of ours, and we walked the whole entire Reedy River corridor being impacted by, the, by this project. And we identified every single species on both sides. And we looked at the health. Um, we were out there with a very fancy mallet to figure out what trees were there and what trees were healthy and unhealthy. And we walked the whole entire thing knowing that, you know, there was going to be a lot of tree loss um, here and that a lot of it was going to be along the Reedy River. And it's a given, you know. So when we went out on site and looked at the tree removals, our first question was, you know, what's the cost benefit analysis of saving trees that ultimately are in the way of restoring a river to a natural meander? It's very hard to do tree protection when you are restoring a river. And it's okay that some trees are gonna be lost. And ultimately what we were pleased with when we went and did our own survey, is that we're not losing a lot of really good stuff. Um, when you walk in between the section of the Reedy River that is gonna be heavily impacted where trees will be lost along that corridor, there were some mature trees that, you know, from just a quick glance, you might think, oh, we're losing these big, beautiful river birch and sycamore, and uh, they weren't in great health. And then there's some ash and there were some elms and both of those are threatened by local pests and diseases. And really when it came down to it, we walked the whole entire thing and assessed the health and identified trees up and down the whole entire thing. And that really came down to six pecan trees that we thought were really awesome and worth saving. And I will note to you that these six pecan trees that we thought were so awesome uh, were young. In, in human terms, they were teenagers. They were like 13 year olds. Um, these pecan trees that were so good looking to us were really only 10 inch caliper trees that we thought were specimen species, but they were really young. Um, the mature canopy along the river corridor is aging out and not healthy. And you know, it's fine. The trees are gonna be removed and they're gonna be replanted. Um, so we can go to the next slide there. So again, um, the tree removals, um, you know, ultimately everything on site, when you move away from the river, there's of course an opportunity to decide, you know, does this tree get to stay? Does this tree get to go? So the city arborists and the city of Greenville working with MKSK, you know, looked at invasive species, which is the majority of the trees along the corridor itself. Um, a lot of, as I mentioned, old unhealthy trees, and then of course, sometimes trees conflict with, you know, 
playgrounds and spaces. And we can find the same problem in our own homes. If we want to expand the footprint of our property or build a garage out back or put in a swimming pool, well, sometimes trees are where we want to build something. And uh, so what Trees Upstate focuses on is let's replant trees, replant good trees, replant them property, properly so that they have the opportunity to live 100 years or more. So the species being removed kind of met some criteria. They were either unhealthy, invasive, or just, you know, in the way where the park needed to be designed. Um, so next slide. Some examples of the invasive species that are all along the river corridor. So again, you know, one of the things that we wanted to address on the front end with marketing, and you know, you've seen our Unity Park video that we made with the city, is that you know, if you're not familiar with tree species and invasives, you can walk that section along the Reedy River and think, oh my gosh, we're losing all of these trees. The majority of it are, you know, um, the tree of heaven and mimosas and mulberries and polonias and, and they're all invasive species and it's a positive thing to get rid of them and ultimately uh, be replanting. So we've got severe threats out there, significant threats, um, but ultimately what this slide is showing is that there was a lot of trees out there that are invasive and really Unity Park is providing us an opportunity to ultimately do restoration. Um, so whereas this is reforestation because trees are being removed and trees are being replanted, another really significant piece is restoration. And Trees Upstate does actually do a lot of restoration work along rivers and creeks and streams. And that includes removing the invasives and replanting what should be there. Next slide, please. So back to the banks, and I've already addressed most of this. So about half of the trees are along the Reedy River. And again, you know, Trees Upstate's assessment on this is other than those six pecans, no great loss. And it's not realistic to think that we can return a, a river to a meander and not lose the stuff along the bank. So it's going to be great. And in the end, the bank will be restored and the species that get replanted are going to be significantly better than what's in there. Um, so this slide, really, the take home message is just that about half the trees that are going to be removed in Unity Park are invasive and unhealthy species along the Reedy Corridor. Next slide, please. So close to 750 trees are gonna be replanted and that's what gets us back to our number of, you know, almost two trees for every one planted. And again, I just wanna reiterate, this is MKSK's work. You know, Trees Upstate just did a lot of review and asked a lot of questions. Um, but this ultimately shows that you can see that once the river is restored to a meander, um, that a lot of trees are gonna be going back in those zones. And, and on some slides to come, we'll see that in greater detail. So you can zip forward, Darren. All right, we don't need to go through this long list, um, but I think that the, the biggest take home message here is the diversity going back into Unity Park. Um, and this was one of, the, one of the reasons why Trees Upstate was actually so excited to be a part of the project and why we think that it is so important for arborists to be engaged from beginning to end of a project. A lot of it is just species review. Um, you know, when you look at designing anything in an urban setting, engaging arborists that see how trees perform in an urban setting and how trees are, you know, have threats with pests and disease uses. Um, that's some, you know, day-to-day -day knowledge that just because of the work that we do, we see it. And I will tell you, you know, I've been the executive director of Trees Upstate now for 13 years, and I've learned more about trees by planting them and watching them grow or struggle than anything that I could read in a textbook. And so the diversity here um, it's just one great example why it's so important to engage arborists to make sure that we've got great diversity um, that, you know, sometimes 
engaging an arborist also can help increase your palate. Um, I've made jokes for years that if I see a plant design, you know, and it's full of a bunch of Armstrong maple and Natchez crepe myrtle, I know exactly what landscape architecture firm did that plan. Um, so really arborists have a much bigger palette than, you know, sometimes just the landscape architect firm might. And that's not to say anything negative. It's just that arborists are very important, are a very important part of the design process, which is why this is such a great model of, um, and hold on this slide, Darren, this is an awesome one, um, why it's so important to engage arborists. Like American hornbeam that you can see here, it's not commercially available readily, you can find it, but this is a great tree and we just don't see it out in the, out in the urban environment. Um, and so it's just something that's off of people's radar. Um, and that's something that having arborists engage, it just increases the diversity and it really focuses on what's urban hardy. And it really helps take a look at threat, threats with pests and diseases because we see them every day and having to manage things. Um, so again, I, you know, I think it was fantastic that the city and Harper and MKSK brought, you know, a bunch of arborists to the table and asked our opinion, um, because it's a great project and it's a great reforestation. And uh, take home message here on this slide, everyone, if you're not familiar with the American hornbeam, start putting it on your planting list and asking about it, because it is a great tree and it's a medium sized tree and so often we need those. Okay, next slide. So one, you know, we heard Darren speak to so many uh, really out of the box and innovative design components with Unity Park, and this is one of them. Um, so often we are so quick to whether it's remove leaves from our front yard or a tree falls and we're gonna get it out of the way, um, a down tree is habitat. And so one of the greatest pieces in this design is that some of the trees removed from site are actually gonna, well, or some of the trees cut down are not gonna be removed. Uh, they're gonna be repurposed uh, to provide habitat. And it's, it's a really neat design component. Next slide there. This is a, bird's eye view of both the park and also the timeline. I saw Dean pop up with a little bit of a question on the timeline. And so, you know, timelines get shifted around. Um, but as of now, uh, you can see the work along the Reedy River and you can see, you know, that that stuff's gonna get started pretty soon. If you walk the area or if you've been down there, you know, you've seen that, you know, over the summer, everything has, you know, popped up all of, Harper's buildings and all of their subcontractors buildings. So this one is really just to give you a timeline of what we're looking at here. What's the next slide? I think we're almost coming to the end. I love this. There is a saying that says the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, the second best time is now. And so this is giving us a few different views here in snapshots. The first is that of course, you know, we've got some mature, unhealthy, at-risk invasive canopy being removed. It's going to take time for that stuff to grow back. So you can see that, you know, MKSK as a design team did a really great job putting the right tree in the right place. So putting the species along the riverbank, you know, and then putting them out in the riparian zone, and then, you know, the drier upland zone. So it's really, it's a, it's a great design with a lot of diversity. And then next slide, Darren, next slides, you start to see these trees grow out, right? So now five to 10 years, they're getting a little bit bigger. Next slide out, Darren, now we're at 15 or 10 to 20 years. And this is the goal here, right? We want mature canopy. We don't get air quality and stormwater benefits until trees are mature. And so we want to make sure that trees are in stalled properly. And again, we've got Tiger River Park, shops at Green Ridge, all of those trees by Cabela's. Um, they weren't planted right. And they're not going to be here like 20 years, 40 years out. They're not going to do anything for us. Um, so, you know, Harper and the city of Greenville were very 
focused on, hey, if we're going to plant these trees, let's just make sure that they are truly around for generations yet to come. You know, we're really planting it forward. Um, and so that's where Trees Upstate will continue to be engaged. So when it's time for the landscape to start being installed, um, I imagine it'll be me um, out there working with the landscape crews just on day one, essentially, um, and doing a demonstration of how to properly plant trees. And I will tell you that I, my expectation for this crew to come in and do the installation, they're gonna have, they're gonna know exactly, you know, what to do, and they're gonna be on top of industry standards. Um, but I provide on-site technical support quite often to landscape crews. And when I teach them how to plant a tree, they're like, oh, we've never done it like that before. We didn't bid it out to do like that, and that's not how I was taught at Clemson in 1950. Um, so anyway. We're excited to be a part of it. And uh, again, great job to MKSK and the city for the, for the plan. It's, it's, it's good. Thank you, Joel and Darren. That's, that's awesome. That's a great presentation. We, we do appreciate it. Um, we'll give about, we got to be respectful of folks time, but we'll give about five minutes or so for some Q and A, if you guys are okay with that. Um, does anybody want to go ahead and unmute and ask some questions? Now's the time to do so. I do have um, two quick questions. Darren and Joel, thank you so much for the presentation today. It's cool to see an update on um, the project. So I just did a survey for um, wayfinding to the Xanthing Norris Bridge, and I was curious if you could talk about um, how you're gonna connect wayfinding from the Swamp Rabbit Trail in downtown to this park. And then a second question, if I'm allowed, um, is how has coordination with DOT been um, even with wayfinding um, within the right of way, knowing like Hudson is an SCDOT road um, and what challenges are you facing in order to get the design you want? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. We um, have just in the past, I guess, month or so sort of expanded the, um, the wayfinding to extend uh, towards downtown so that we're better picking up users that are coming from downtown to the park. So that's in the works and we've been making sure that that's, that's well coordinated with the city. Um, from, a, from a Hudson standpoint, uh, honestly, we, we didn't have any issues with DOT. There, there are really no conflicts with the proposed design. I mean, the, the biggest hurdles on Hudson really had to do more with Duke Energy um, than I think DOT, but I, I, we were fortunate in that regard. Okay, any more questions? All right, if you do have any questions, I think Darren, you put up your uh, your email address. We appreciate that. And Joelle as well, you can reach out to her or feel free to contact Dean or Justine if you have any more questions about the project or any questions in general. Um, I'm gonna kick it over to Dean here for a minute to give us an update on the, uh, the upstate comprehensive plan, so uh, review. So, uh, Dean. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, as uh, has been mentioned, and some of you will remember back in 2015, we did, uh, in partnership with uh, uh, classes at Clemson, uh, a review of the comprehensive plans for the counties uh, in the upstate nine at the time, Union County at the time did not have a comprehensive plan. Uh, and we felt like, uh, with uh, several of the counties having uh, done updates to it uh, in the last couple years, uh, that this would be a good time to uh, uh, do a, uh, another uh, analysis, or a review of that, uh, and an update uh, to the county uh, uh, comprehensive plan review. So uh, we have a student, uh, Kyle from Clemson, who is working on it uh, right now, and, and several of you have been involved in that um, as a uh, part of our steering committee for that, and we appreciate it. We have him uh, basically working on a number of different milestones. A uh, couple of things in addition to just the comprehensive uh, plan analysis uh, that was done or updating what was done in 2015. One is that in, in 2015, uh, there were not city, any cities were included. So um, we know ci the cities of uh, Greenville and Spartanburg uh, as well as others uh, are in the process or have done uh, recently their updated comprehensive plans. So uh, we're looking at, at city plans at some, in some way as part of this analysis as well. So there will be uh, some look at at least a couple of the larger uh, city plans. Then also 
uh, the connection between uh, land use and transportation has been something that's been talked about quite a lot. So in the second semester, uh, one of the pieces uh, that uh, Kyle is gonna look at is, uh, is that element and how the comprehensive plan specifically look at uh, the relationship between uh, land use and transportation and other uh, things related to that. Uh, we're also gonna look at some things related to, to water utilities um, in the second semester. So we're excited about uh, the work that Kyle is doing. Um, he, uh, as I said, we, we have um, structured this. So he has milestones and deliverables throughout the process. Uh, he is in the phase of finishing the first set of those deliverables and whether it's, uh, I'm not sure whether it'll be in this calendar year or in the early part of 2021, but we will, for this group, have an update from Kyle on what he's doing uh, and you know what the first half of his work has been. So more than likely in January, uh, expect that. But um, you know we're real excited about the work he's doing. And again, I wanna thank uh, those of you who have been engaged and um, uh, we'll continue to, to update you on the work that, that Kyle's doing over the next several months. Michael? Thank you, Dean, that's uh, good to hear. Um, just real quick, there's an air quality meeting um, tomorrow at 2 p.m., is that correct? And it, over Zoom, so um, I believe, Justine, you sent out the, uh, the uh, information for that within the last few days. Um, and Dean and Justine, if you don't have anything else, we'll go ahead and, uh, and adjourn. Yep, that's it. Thank you, everybody. Okay, everybody have a great day. Stay safe and we'll see you all soon. Thanks, Darren and Joelle. We appreciate it. Yes, thank you. That's great.